everyone. My name is Natasha from the Alumni Relations team. Welcome to the recording of our Alumni Careers webinar. Do you have what it takes to be an entrepreneur? We were very fortunate to have Melbourne University alumna Madeline Grummet and Laura Youngson, two very successful entrepreneurs who are going to inspire you through their insights. This webinar aims to equip you with useful skill sets to be a successful entrepreneur in the age of digital disruption. This webinar addresses the role of innovation in the age of digital disruption and explains the right skill sets, such as design thinking needed in the face of the changing workforce. Additionally, they will cover key entrepreneurship traits to have, even as an employee with an organization. Now, we'll jump straight into the conversation where Laura Youngson, a current master's student, is introducing Madeline. Um, Madeline also does a lot of interesting things, so works on a lot of advisory boards um, and works with a lot of startup founders and doing a lot of mentoring. So you'll see her this weekend at the three-day startup at the Wade Institute, where she's co-facilitating. Um, yeah, generally doing lots of speaking on panels and hopefully sharing some of your insights with us this evening. Absolutely. And... Laura, delighted to be here in conversation with you. Um, Laura, as we said, is studying uh, at the Wade Institute of Entrepreneurship, but she's a pretty exceptional individual all round. So some of you mightn't know that Laura actually took the stage at TEDx this week in Melbourne and did a TED talk, which is just wow. Yeah, like, pretty, pretty on incredible. everyone's bucket list, there should be a <laughs> TED talk. And, um, and that talk was all about how she set a world record. She set a world record playing the world's highest altitude soccer match ever. Um, and we can talk more about that later. Um, so Laura is the co-founder of a business called Equal Playing Field, and it really is trying to challenge the gender inequalities that sit in sport, traditionally. She's had roles across trade advisory, uh, across government, not-for-profit and enterprise, and, uh, and as we said, is about to uh, complete her master's, and I can't wait to see what you do next, Laura. <laughs> Um, so we're looking forward to being in conversation with you all tonight. We're going to turn the video off shortly uh, and we're going to get into the major content of this webinar and we really hope, hope to equip a lot of you with these skills you're going to need in innovation, entrepreneurship and startup into your future careers. So thanks for joining us tonight. So before we go into some of those skills, let's have a look at the context within which we are talking. So this slide here um, has got a lot of information on it, but basically what we're talking about here are some of the meta trends that are really defining the market uh, and some of the forces in the job market at the moment. So what we know is that today the pace of change in global markets and in the broader workforce, it's exponential. It's unprecedented. We live in an age of wide scale disruption and there are things like automation, the digitization of our economies and such. And, and this is provoking this new digi digital age or this knowledge age. So what do I mean by that? The knowledge age is really a new advanced form of capitalism in which knowledge and ideas, so intellectual property, are the main source of new economic growth. So this is over and above land or labor or some of the tangible resources that really define the economies of the past. So this means that traditional workforce is, is changing. And it means today's jobs are changing with it. And for you as a student or, or a recent graduate, it really means this pace of change um, is, is really transforming what these jobs of the future are going to mean for you. And it's why it's really important we talk about some of these changes tonight. So let's look at Australia, for example. And Laura, I know you're not from Australia, but uh, here we've been really reliant on mining in the past. And we know that this has a finite term and already sales to China are slowing down. And so we can't rely on these traditional resources anymore. We actually need to create new jobs so that our future population can, can be employed and, and have means. So, um, so when we look at those changes and we look at our transition into the digital age, we can see that many traditional industrial age legacy sectors are now relying on innovation and entrepreneurship as the key to creating new value for themselves. And in the face of this, startups are really redefining the marketplace within which they operate. So I mentioned this word before, exponential technology, and it basically means technologies 
that that are exp that are exponent exponential in their application. So let's have a look at the iPhone, for example, as an as as a really great example of a technology that's just transformed the entire planet. So it was ten years ago only that the iPhone. What? It's it's pretty crazy, isn't it? Right. So yes. so since then, the iPhone has sold one point three billion units and obviously skyrocketed Apple into the business stratosphere. But more than that, let's just have a think about what the iPhone did to our traditional markets. All that connectivity, all that transaction that's occurring, all the communication, it's really transformed our everyday lives in work and in play. Um, and it's given rise to whole new applications of industry, to the sharing economy, which we'll talk about later, and also to obviously our, our social media communication. And, you know, I can only imagine life without this now. If you have a look at this slide, there are two logos there. One of them is for Singularity University and the other is for Comet Labs. I've been lucky enough to visit these places and um, uh, if you're interested in exploring more about exponential technology, Singularity University is in um, just outside of San Francisco and they explore the Internet of Things and robotics and the future of work and self-driving cars, etc. And Comet Labs are a venture capital firm that invest only in exponential technology businesses like robotics. So jump on their websites and you can really get some incredible information um, about what's happening in those sectors. Um, but let's move on and really look at, as I said, this, this age of rapid communication and it's enabling this global connectivity and new job market opportunities. And some of these stats here are pretty wow about what happens in 60 seconds. Yeah, just take a look at this slide for a moment. In an internet minute, this is the amount of rapid fire communication that's going on. Whoa. So I think what's interesting on this is actually you've got digital disruption across borders and across boundaries. So these companies are really global and actually that's changing how we do business. Yeah, that's right, Laura. So um, it's really enabled startups to enter markets with web-based cloud computing business platforms. So this is this digital disruption that we've talked about. And if you look at this slide, um, you know, there are some great examples here uh, of that. So... If you look at that, then you look at the traditional job market and, and traditional sectors are really struggling to keep up with this pace of digital dis disruption. If you look at Uber, Airbnb, uh, Google, they're really defining new economies of play and stay. And if you look at, say, blockchain or Bitcoin, um, you know, in relation to the banking sector, you can see banks, even here in Melbourne, are really struggling to redefine their value prop in this digital age. So, um, so it really is a phenomenal time. And what we know is that startups are the ones who are really redefining this marketplace and changing industry. And you can see here, there's some great examples of how um, traditional you know, magazine media have, have been absolutely disrupted by new players, Dropbox, uh, Twitter has become the major news source for most people. So you can see here some, some live examples that many people listening will have no doubt uh, be using day to day. So, what about you? How does this actually relate to you? How are you going to keep up in the face of this? And what skills are you going to use to survive in this rapidly changing workplace? I think one of the, the interesting questions for everyone listening at home is, how do you know if you've got what it takes to be an entrepreneur? Well, it's a $64 million question, isn't it, Laura? Yeah. Well, how do you know what it takes? Um, well, look, according to a recent report, one in three university students want to start their own business. So interestingly, there seems to be an appetite for entrepreneurship. But where do you start, indeed? And how do you know if you can actually, you know, give it a good crack? And when I started entrepreneurship um, years ago, you're probably about 10 years ago now, I think I um, was uncertain myself about whether I had what it takes. But it's very much a learning by doing uh, yeah. entrepreneurship. Before we step into what it takes, I just want to quickly talk about um, sort of the jobs of the future that I tapped into before. And this slide here um, references an organisation called the Foundation for Young Australians. And they've done some awesome white papers and research papers on the future of work. And I would really encourage you to jump on their website and have a look. Um, one thing we know from their research is that, you know, you do need to prepare for disruption and you do need to prepare for automation and we know that in the future um, of work this generation will have probably about 15 jobs across five different industries. Are the robots taking your jobs? 
I am a robot. Yes, they will. Um, they will in some sectors, but actually um, automation, I think it's a big scary word, isn't it? We look at automation in the legal sector and in, a, in the finance sector, but yep. probably automation will eat certain um, areas of industry and then other new areas will grow out uh, and, of course, need humans to service them. But um, back to this whole 15 jobs across five industries, how are you going to survive in that work environment? What you're going to need are enterprise skill sets. So again, you'll hear a lot about this. Enterprise skill sets are transferable skill sets. They are skills like creativity, design thinking, problem solving, uh, collaboration and teamwork, which easy to say, hard to do sometimes. And these will allow you to have cross functionality within organisations. Uh, so and, yeah. with, with this portfolio career, I mean, you've done a lot of different jobs. Do you think this is something that you have? Um, yeah, absolutely. So my work is, is, is very much described as a portfolio career. And what it means is basically you're working a full-time job, but with multiple part-time jobs, if you like. So I, you know, run my own startup. I work a couple of days for Melbourne University. I hold some board positions. I consult. And all of this adds up to a full-time job. So it means you have to self-manage. You have to transfer those skill sets across all those um, different jobs. And yes, you have to be a good problem solver on, um, the, on the fly. And presumably you have to be quite comfortable with change, given that it's changing so rapidly. Well, you do, you do. And I, I do like change, I've got to say. But um, let's, let's talk about Melbourne uh, specifically, where we are tonight. So the great news is that you're in the right place. If you want to have a portfolio career, if you want to become an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur, or at least build your startup skill set, you're in the right place. This city is an absolute thriving ecosystem of new ideas, of fabulous research, supported by a deep network of advisors and investors and academics. And of course, uh, Melbourne University itself and the surrounds boasts one of the largest uh, research and university clusters in the world. And we know that some of the commercialization of the research out of Melbourne University um, is, is second to none in the world. So this is great news for those of you sitting at home wondering how on earth you're gonna keep up with the pace of all this change. So why don't we do a little bit of a deep dive into innovation? Yeah, what let's, is, let's have a look at a bit further at actually what is it that's starting this revolution? Okay, so and, and also how do you take part in well, it actually? Yeah. If you're uh, sitting at home with your, with your cup of tea, how are you going to get an innovative mindset and an entrepreneurial skill set that lets you survive in this fast-moving environment. So, so innovation itself is a word that we're hearing a lot at the moment. Uh, it's every second word in the newspaper, it's in industry, and, and innovation really is, is, is what's fueling disruption. So innovation is the scale, I suppose. Innovation can be small iterations to make things just a bit better. Innovation can creating, be creating completely new things. And it can also um, be creating new things that make the old things redundant. Um, so Completely turning them on their head. Yeah, exactly. So the key, I suppose, for you listening at home is don't be scared of it. The thing is to embrace disruption and embrace change early. Don't react to it later because you can't fight innovation. Innovation is the market moving and, and like it or not, the market is going to keep moving. One of the key terms you may hear in the innovation scape is this term called disruptive innovation. So if you look at this slide here, this gives you um, uh, a good graphic on, on what that is. Disruptive innovation is a term uh, really in the field of business administration, which refers to innovation creating new market and value networks. Um, and basically this is market and displaces established market value. So um, think of Airbnb or Uber or even some of the new fintechs that open out whole new economies of scale where none have existed before. Um, so that's what we talk about with disruptive innovation. But sort of the, the innovation that happens at the beginning of the scale is where you look at innovation to produce new products and services. And a good way to think about this is for yourself, how do you innovate or employ entrepreneurial thinking so that you can sort of stay ahead or, or even create the curve is make something people want. Like the world is full of widgets that no one wants, no one buys and that go into landfill. So the best businesses are those that, cre that um, create something that solves a real problem for a real person. Okay, so that sounds really simple, but actually is it, I mean, 
Yeah, look, it's hard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, look, I How suppose, hard is it? I Do suppose tell it, us. Yeah. it is hard. Innovation is hard because it's innovation is saying I'm going to push beyond status quo, isn't it? So yeah. I'm not going to keep doing the same job or the same business that I've always done. I'm going to actually put some energy into trying to realise new values. So it, it is more difficult than sitting still and waiting for the world to move past you. The thing is there are some fantastic tools that you can use to innovate. So let's have a quick step through some of these, and these are, are critical tools that are used within the startup and entrepreneurship landscape. The first is design thinking. So design thinking is a methodology that's used to solve complex or, or wicked problems. And um, it's come out of uh, IDEO, which is a design firm over in San Francisco. There's a great TED talk again by Tim Brown, the founder of design thinking, um, if you'd like to look at it, and it's had millions of views. Um, but it allows you to immerse yourself in the experience of the user so that you can gain insight into their world to effectively then define the problem you are solving for them. What do I mean by that? So here's a simpler way to look at it. And this model I'm showing on this slide is from the Stanford D School. And this is their five-step version of um, design thinking. So can you, can you take us through this? What are the, the sort of five I reckon steps? you should take us through it, Laura, yeah, because yeah, I know you testing, have been testing, studying so design thinking. Actually, one of the... This is, this is a great tool that I love using for every time I sort of come up with an idea, essentially, a good way to, to see whether it's going to go anywhere so the first thing really empathizing with people so putting yourself in the um in the minds of the user and if you're if you can actually put yourself in the in the shoes of the person that's going to use whatever you're you're doing or whatever it's actually looking at it from the problem side as well so yeah what problems really, do people have what that's right how do you really define that problem rather than assume that you know how to solve yeah for homelessness or or consumer issue and yeah. design thinking is great for these really what they call wicked problems they're so interrelated they're so complex that you you really have to delve deep in there are lots of interconnected effects so to empathizing defining then you start to have these solutions so thinking of ways that you can solve it i think the brilliant thing about design thinking is it really focuses on the prototyping and testing and this is the best way to really get through and test your products and understand is it, is it actually something that people want so going back to the empathizing have you built something that people care about that's right and one of the, and in the middle of that slide there you see the ideate uh, which pretty much means coming up with ideas but it's not disneyland like often this is contextual ideation so it's coming up with creative solutions um, that can be divergent but that ultimately converge toward a testable prototype at the end of that model and um, it's when you see design thinking used well it's an absolutely extraordinary uh, working framework um, for producing new value for companies so it's a great one within startup and it also means you don't waste any resources so I think we'll come on to it just now but the lean startup method great is also a great way, to, way yes to look at this so really this is a fantastic methodology um, it is and again you're studying uh, that methodology at, at the way but in fact this is employed all over the world uh, in many businesses now this is used um, it was developed by a guy called Eric Reitz and you can see the book title up there any of you who are interested or in fact online there's plenty of resource so he developed this uh, this lean startup model and it look, it basically aims to sort of shorten a product or service um, development life cycle so if you think about traditionally businesses that want to create new products or services they might spend a lot of money a lot of people uh, resource and take a long time to get it to market and by the time they do they might find they produce a product that nobody wants so lean startup really proposes um, a very quick cycle learning loop uh, which is illustrated on this slide and it's the build measure learn loop so you quickly build you quickly measure or track, and then you uh, you quickly learn from customers whether you're actually making something that they want or need. And so this favours experimentation over elaborate or expensive planning. It values customer feedback over a closed door intuition, like some whole bunch of creatives sitting around on the That's bats, a great idea. Inventing, yeah. yeah, let's do it. No one's going to use it. Yeah. Exactly. And it also favours iteration over long cycle production. So um, by that I mean just small changes based on um, customer feedback. And this is part of what forms the product market fit. So the product really fits the market and is aligned very 
uh, very closely. Now, we know we've got a question from Ryan. And Ryan, thanks for being with us tonight. And we'd love to answer your question in just a minute. We're just going to step through a couple more of these innovation frameworks, and then we'd love to have a, have a chat to you. So yeah, um, just going back to this, so the Lean Startup Methodology, this is actually one of the, the best tools for every time you have an idea, especially as a startup, because it's really useful to make sure you don't waste your resources, so your time, your money, um, because as you know, it will, if you're a, a start in the startup phase, you often don't have much time because it's just you or just a couple of you, don't have much money because you're just you're creating the idea. So actually it's a really efficient way, very cost effective way to get to this working model and get to prototype and testing very quickly. Absolutely. And you'll see even some of the biggest companies in the world now are doing fantastic prototyping with wireframing where you're sketching up a website rather than building it. You're literally with paper doing a flip book like you'd do back in the 70s and sketching what that UX or that user journey map might look like. Or you might actually be building a physical product but out of paper like, yeah. like a play school, um, but you see big companies doing this now because it's critical to a lean, um, a lean approach to their business delivery. So another great tool uh, that you see used a lot in startups is this rather complex and dense looking uh, image up here. This is called a business model canvas. Now, you're not expected to read all of the moving parts, but here are the key things to know about this. So this was created by a guy, a really smart guy called Alexander Osterwalder. What he managed to do was really crystallise and distill the working parts of a business down to all these, these core channels here. And it's a way that you can completely visualise and represent all the moving parts of your business and how its revenue is generated in one quick snapshot. And it's very, very widely used right across Silicon Valley and in many startups um, around the world. And it often does work in conjunction, Laura, as you said, with the lean startup. Mm, yeah, this is great. So I use this quite a lot because I have lots of ideas. Um, and so immediately you can, you can spend 30 minutes just throwing all your ideas down on this, on this canvas and you get a real sense of whether it's worth investigating the business. And also whether it's, uh, you, you have a good look at there, the cost structures and revenues, you can get quite an idea just from sort of writing down what you've got, whether it's worth uh, investing time in. So it's really good to sort of come up with hypotheses and work out whether you should invest any more time and effort on it. So absolutely, really absolutely. And I'll show you a couple of examples of some businesses you'll know uh, where we've applied this business model canvas. I'll just acknowledge Caroline, thanks for being with us tonight. We've got a fantastic question about whether, um, whether cities that are reliant on agriculture can convert into being startup and entre entrepreneurship hubs. Absolutely they can. I've done a lot of work across uh, social enterprise and social entrepreneurship, as has Laura. We'd love to tap into that question later. Yeah. So moving on just to a couple of, couple of examples of the business model canvas for McDonald's and Airbnb, businesses we would all know. Um, and you can see here how they've captured their value across their, across their business models. Um, I won't read all the detail, but um, later you can have a look in at that and really see how they've broken their, their business up into those moving parts. Um, we're going to move on to another tool. And this one actually is a really, this is one of my favourite tools actually. This tool was also invented by the, uh, the wonderful Osterwalder, Alexander, of which we spoke before. You'll find this in that book, a couple of slides prior, the Business Model Canvas book. This is called the Value Proposition Canvas. Now, it looks like a, a pretty drawing. What it actually is, is a fantastic tool for really focusing in on the customer. So it's great for human-centred design. And what it does is it looks at the customer's real pains and real gains relative to the jobs that need to be done by them to, to what your product or service will do to do jobs for that customer. So, so it, it really enables you to deeply put the customer at the heart of your value proposition or your business and understand how you're solving their pain points or solving their problems and delivering gains or solutions to them. So um, this is identified as jobs to be done by the customer. You can see on the right hand side of the circle there that and that's a really fabulous tool and you can learn more about that in the book for those of you who want to go deeper. So they're pretty much the overall toolkits, Laura, aren't they, that you yeah, would use? Yeah, it was a really good starting point. Um, and if you're interested in entrepreneurship, that's, it's such a great way to kind of delve into these toolkits and get a sense of how you'd go about taking your idea from what it is in your head down to actually putting it on paper and seeing, seeing fleshing it out, see what comes. That's it, that's it. So 
Should we go back to the $64 million question? Yeah. We don't have a prize, I'm sorry. If we did, we'd, we'd give it out. But uh, the question is this. So, yeah, are you an entrepreneur or are you an entrepreneur? Or, well, do you just have what it takes in general? Or are you both? Well, that is the question. I mean, I play a role in both. Like you I do. run a startup, but I also consult as an entrepreneur, if you like, yeah, so inside organisations. How do you define them? All right, so what's the difference? Well, yeah, like have more freedom. I love that about entrepreneurs. You don't really because you're working all the time. But um, so what's the primary difference? Well, an entrepreneur, usually that would refer to a person who starts their own business with a new idea or concept and they really work on it on their own. They're the founder. It's, a, it's very much from the genesis of that idea or business. An entrepreneur typically has that. Um, an entrepreneur would traditionally um, represent an employee, so someone who actually works delivering um, innovation inside an organisation or an enterprise. So um, we can see some great examples of that in Melbourne, at, for example, at, at PwC, at PricewaterhouseCoopers, at Ernst & Young, some of these big consultancy firms have got their own innovation hubs now and they're really um, looking for those skill sets for people to come in and help realise new value for them. So when we think about entrepreneurship, often we people like this come to mind. Right, you've got your really geeky looking Bill Gates there oh. on the left. We've got a great Colonel Sanders Colonel, on the right. Yes. I mean, he Excellent. was an entrepreneur, really. I, I don't, I mean, fried chicken, sure, but that, that's an amazing franchise. Um, you think of Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, I don't know, who do you think of when you think of an entrepreneur? Oh, that's tough. Um, yeah, Elon Musk is, I think, the entrepreneur of the moment, really. Serial entrepreneur, really pushing the boundaries of where. Where what even we think about different industries, like yeah, completely he, reinventing things. Yeah, he's he's sort of uh, he's what you call moonshot, uh, you know, style entrepreneur. I actually really like um, Canva, which is from here in Melbourne. So they, I mean, it's ostensibly quite a, a simple problem. I just want to make good Instagram photos, or I want to have a template for making an amazing presentation. Yeah, and they've and that turned started, that yeah. into this incredible startup um, that's, that's really global now. Yeah, they have, that's right. But in, we, we know actually in Australia it is a great ecosystem and in Melbourne, but um, I think it's only 34% of operators in the ecosystem here are female. And so mm. it'd be good to see more women getting involved. Hopefully we've inspired a few of you tonight to um, start at least dipping your toe into the water of entrepreneurship. So... Let's have a look at sort of what that might look like once you start investigating entrepreneurship. So anyone can have an idea, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but I come up with ideas all the time. And Literally all my, 100 during this presentation. Yeah. yeah. You know? it, well, same. And there might be some of you listening tonight thinking, I've had this cracking idea and I really want to turn it into a business, but I, I don't really know how to. So... This guy up here, this quite serious looking fellow with his specs off, is, is a guy called Peter Drucker and he was a, an industrial age intellectual and he really um, uh, was quite an extraordinary thinker around the future of markets. And he said rather famously, the best way to predict the future is to create it. And that ultimately the purpose of any business today or 100 years ago is to create and keep a customer. So... Really, if you've got an idea, you need to work out whether is it viable enough to create and keep a customer. And sounds simple, hard to execute, and hard to execute at scale. So create and keep a customer means keeping that customer happy over their customer lifetime. So, um, so let's, let's think about what that looks like. So one of the things that I know is critical to entrepreneurship is is really defining the why. Why would want people want to engage with your idea? And Simon Sinek has a fabulous TED talk on defining why, and it's really worth a watch, but it, it really looks at um, looking deeply into you working out what is your why as an entrepreneur or as a worker. So if happiness comes from what we do, fulfilment comes from why we do it. And if you can connect your job to directly to your why and feel fulfilled well you're going to have a much greater chance of success so it's really talking about what's your purpose what's your cause um like why do you get out of bed in the morning because it it's definitely not for the dollars uh, as a, a startup entrepreneur i think um madeline you'll agree but a lot of the the entrepreneurial stories they really start with a couple of people sort of sitting there eating noodles for months um, and trying to make something great but they're, they're truly inspired 
to to change things. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And if we talk about purpose and values-led um, organisations, we know the new hiring practice in the new economy is really looking for people who do have that deeply at, at the centre of what they do, that they're not just turning up to the job to punch a clock and go home and draw their salary. They're really being there because they're, they're genuinely investing uh, in the organisation and aligning their value set to it. So let's let's look at um, sort of how you would start to look at um, cultivating your own purpose and developing some traits that in, uh, allow you to operate in a market as an entrepreneur. So we've got here a number of traits that I, if you did a study across all the successful entrepreneurs, you'd find a lot of them tick a lot of these boxes. Now, the thing is, can it be taught? And that, well, that's the question, isn't it? What do you think? I think it can. I, I think there's a certain personality, there's a certain personality who's probably going to uh, have a naturally better chance of success at entrepreneurship. And some of those, you know, real world changing entrepreneurs probably have those traits and had them from a very young age. Um, but and I think one of those things is being incurably curious, intensely curious, you know, thirsting for knowledge all the time, always pushing, always saying why. I think that's something you find many entrepreneurs have, probably a little bit annoying as well, yep. but you do find that. But the other things are resilience and a really high risk appetite because you're going to fail a lot and you're going to try a lot of stuff and you need to be able to cope with that and get up again and find a new way forward or pivot and find a new door to open. Do I think those are the most important I think those, and I think you've got to be adaptable. So we talked about adaptability before, but I mean really able to cope with working alone, working with end-to-end -end solutions, you know, problem solving on the fly, problem solving for areas you've never even delved into before. And you need to be able to um, expand and contract your skill set in an inside and outside of teams. Yeah. And, and not everyone's comfortable with that, especially if you've been in a vertical function or you've trained in a university course uh, studied in a university course um, that spits you out into sort of a vertical track career. But, um, yeah, but I do think there's some certain traits you absolutely can cultivate. So, Lorinda, thank you for your question. We're going to get to that very shortly with our Q&A. We've got some great questions coming in. If you want anything answered, then pop it up now and we'll uh, be there shortly. Absolutely. And um, we... In, in terms of ideas, and I know, Lorinda, you're saying, have you actually come up with the ideas? You know, ideas don't have to be earth shattering. They can be super simple. Like who came up with the idea of a straw? Or who came up with the idea of a post-it note? You know, or... And most ideas are stolen anyway. So, you know, it's not the first ones that did it. Was Google the first people to build an algorithm to do a search engine function? No, they were just better at it. Well, so. they, were just, um, they were just first to market, you know, really at, at scale. And the thing is... Let's be frank here. So nine out of ten startups fail. Right? That's really high figure. That's so do, that's doom and gloom. There. We should, yeah, you should just quit right now. But yeah. um, but you know, everyone can. Well, most people can come up with a reasonable idea, but it's the execution that's the hard part. So there's this term in startup land called um, valley of death, and it really refers to the difficulty of that early stage of your business development where you're bootstrapping. That is, you're paying you know, your own way, and you're trying to cover really a negative cash flow um, before your product or service is bringing in revenue from customers. So, um, you know, your cash burn is really high and you need to be able to get through that valley of death before you see that hockey stick, you know, uptick in, in your revenue generation. And that, and that can be super hard to navigate. You've got to be able to really cope with the yeah. stress of that, right? And that's where your skills and traits and the things that you learn come in really handy to kind of get you over that. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we can talk more about that later and we're really keen to get to your questions in a moment. So I thought I'll just leave you with, for those of you, if we have suddenly switched a light on in your head, we hope, you ha we, hope we have. Um, there's a whole lot of resources here um, that you can, uh, you can use and these are really some of the sort of seminal works across the entrepreneurship and startup scape that would be excellent to look at. Some of them we've mentioned tonight and others we haven't. The Startup Owner's Manual in the centre there by... Um, by Steve. Steve Blank. Blank, yeah. yep, is an excellent one around customer development. So there's those. The other thing you could do if you are part of the university is to pop into the Wade Institute of Entrepreneurship. It's right over near Ormond College. It has some awesome events going on through the year. 
um, and it's where the Master of Entrepreneurship is held and that is part of the Faculty of um, Business and Economics and you can jump online and, and have a look at what that, they've got going on there. And the other thing you could do is um, look at some of these resources on the slide here. If you click through those um, active links, you will land on all sorts of amazing sites that um, that cover really a lot of the um, the broader ecosystem activity that's going on in Melbourne. So um, Launch Victoria and Startup Victoria in particular were initiatives of the Victorian government. And these are creating accelerators to try and grow, bolster the ecosystem of entrepreneurial activity. And they have heaps of events going on all the time. Um, Three-day startup in the corner there on the right. I'm actually co-facilitating that. It's a very intense 56-hour build a business weekend and that's happening actually tomorrow night at the Wade Institute right through till Sunday night. So we've got 45 people who are going to come up with ideas, form teams and build businesses by Sunday night. I think that's a really good taster way to get involved in uh, kind of startups and dipping your toe to see whether it's really for you and kind of understanding and the pitch nights that Startup Victoria run are fantastic and you get to kind of go there and meet lots of people that are they're asking exactly the same questions. Yeah, that's right. Well, let's, um, we'd love to hear from all you guys. Thanks, there's lots and lots of you who've joined us tonight and we do hope we've, um, we've piqued your interest. We'd love now to answer some of the questions that you have um, you've put forward to us. So, Laura, what have we got there? Yeah, so great. So, first questions from Ryan. So, he's really asking about, we've talked a lot about um, the digital marketplace, but actually where, does, where do hobby businesses fit into this? Um, and do you think they'll just cease to exist or um, will they find a gap to continue? I think it's a really great, great question, Ryan. I mean, I suppose a lot of the um, digital disruption is driven by businesses that can scale really quickly, that can actually penetrate um, beyond local markets. And um, so hobby businesses, I mean, some hobby business, businesses start like that and they go on to generate huge customer bases. So. I would say I can't predict what happens in the future and what hobby might turn into some big unicorn, but I can say that uh, keep going. If you've got a great idea and a niche audience, then I think you need to um, look at where you can take that business. So one of the ones that I would say to look at from the UK is actually Kath Kidson um, because she started just as kind oh, of a yeah. hobby in Notting Hill and had all these fabrics and now she's entered um, the Asian market and you see everywhere. And so actually, I think there's still an opportunity. You just have to look at how you're, you need to innovate your supply chain. Um, That's it. And distribution, I think, is one of the biggest barriers to hobby businesses, especially um, distribution and production. Uh, but if you look at Etsy and those sorts of platforms, um, they've got an extraordinary number of people selling uh, and exchanging value on those platforms now. So I think there's been a huge shift of, uh, in hobby markets. Great. Um, we're going to go to another tricky one, which is, well, not so tricky. Uh, I'll perhaps answer this one. But Caroline's asked, do you think African cities like Nairobi can become entrepreneurship hubs, given that it's predominantly an agricultural nation? Now, interestingly, I spent a lot of time in uh, Tanzania and Mozambique, um, and I got to know um, some of the accelerators and tech hubs there. And actually, Nairobi's got an amazing um, tech hub scene. Uh, I think they've got iHub, and so there's so much innovation happening. Now, one of the fascinating things for me, and this would be a brilliant business, is here in Melbourne, we've got um, FarmApp and FarmPay, which are two businesses looking at actually revolutionising the farm business. And if you could take that over to, to Nairobi and combine with some of the technology coming out there, wow, there are some real opportunities. So I think it, it's already happening. It is. And if you look at, you know, the, the stats around the number of people who are going to own mobile phones into the future, this will be an incredibly empowering tool for people to trade currency and to track currency and to be transparent about their economies uh, and access other market so I think it's there are some challenges of course and there is much to be done to um, bridge the digital divide um, but I think yeah if we look at some of these hubs you're right there's some, some great new microfinance um, happening in those areas and some great new businesses developing. That's cool so Lorinda's asked how to go about getting ideas so very driven towards entrepreneurship but perhaps needs a few ideas what would you, you recommend? About getting ideas gosh I mean so I'd say, well, I'd say don't worry. <laughs> what you should do, and this perhaps goes on to someone else has asked, what do you think of partnership with a friend to start a business? Actually, partner with someone that has tons of ideas. So find someone that is working on something and you think, oh, yeah, that's really great because there's so many people that have these great ideas but don't have people to work with. Yeah, that's right. And not everyone has to be a founder. 
Um, that's the thing. You can be an entrepreneur. You can be involved in an awesome startup and awesome entrepreneurial activity and bring some great skill sets to it. But you don't have to be the one who had that single idea. And the interesting thing about ideas is everyone thinks it has to be this sort of big boom light bulb, you know, idea that's going to change the world. And it doesn't. It can be really simple, small solutions to everyday problems. And if you have an insight or an inkling for how you might fix that small problem, it might end up being being an idea, you know, that does that does change the world, at least in that small way. So um, I think, yeah, a lot of people, even like when you're studying entrepreneurship, I think you can get caught up in trying to come up with the next Google, right? Yeah, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Well, not for me, but, you know. Um, so, yeah, and the other thing with ideas is... Um, Stay curious. Keep, keep your mind open uh, to opportunities. If you're cruising around the supermarket, if you're out and about, it's often those small noticings that can reveal big insights. And if you're interested in this sort of thing, there's a fantastic book. I know we've given you a lot of books to look at, but there's an amazing um, guy called Martin Lindstrom and he wrote this fabulous book called Small Data. And it's all about his work as a behavioural uh, scientist observing people go about their everyday lives and how from that he gleans insight uh, that he then feeds into companies like Lego or, or Google, et cetera, to say, uh, to show them how people go about their everyday lives and how they can then move their product to fit that. So um, small data, Martin Lindstrom, excellent okay, book. Great one. And then sort of the follow-up to that, what do you think of then if you are going to start a business and there's a partnership with a friend, what do you think about that? Well, I do know some stats, as would you, that a lot of the reason yeah. startups also fail is not being able to get through the valley of death, as we talked about earlier, um, because they haven't got access to the enough resource, um, financial or human. The other reason they can fail is because of founder issues. And we know that um, that's that's a critical problem, that that the people you work with inside a startup, and it's a, it's a an intense, fast-paced environment, that can put a lot of pressure on relationships. So whoever you do go into business with, make sure you would be happy to spend a lot of time with them. Uh, even it's like a marriage, really, isn't it? It it's is. It's like, would you get married to that person? Like a very oh, dysfunctional yeah. marriage. Like a dysfunctional family. That you're stuck in. Yeah. Yeah. You can't divorce. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of speed dating. Not speed dating. You need to have... Uh, Without yeah. the joy. Yeah. yeah no, exactly. that's not true. So next question, Dante. Um, He's a high school teacher, fantastic. And he's talking about um, teaching innovation and focusing on skills. So do you have any recommendations for younger entrepreneurs? So this actually is perfect for Madeline with Girl Up. I sure do, Dante. And great to um, hear you tapping into a webinar like this um, because I think education is the very industry that needs to disrupt itself in order to grow this next generation of, of innovators, of STEM champions, um, of future leaders. I think education plays such a critical role and teachers in, in driving and transforming that new worker of the future. So again, I would ask you to tap back into um, the Foundation for Young Australians resource that we mentioned earlier. I think that's got some fabulous um, white papers on the future of, of work and education. Um, I also um, think there are some great resources. If you jump on actually Startup Victoria and Launch Victoria, um, you'll find some really great information there as well about enterprise skill building. and. Girl World, which is the startup that I run, we're specifically for secondary school girls. We hold big summits uh, once a year. We've got one coming up next year in March and um, have lots of digital resources as well about enterprise skill sets. Um, the other resource that I think would be terrific in a high school setting is Cool Australia Education. And again, it's an online digital platform. It's a resource where you can download full lesson plans and rich curriculum assets um, that sit across all of this space. So I'd encourage you to have a look at that. Thanks for the question. Great. So we've got a couple of other questions. So first of all, Marco, who's given us a tip. So he uses a great tool, an eye tool called the eye molecule, customer problem solution triangle paradigm. So very customer focused. So we'll check that out Thanks for sure. That. Thank you. Always iterating with our startup knowledge. Um, and then another question. So what are your thoughts on network marketing? So I guess this... I don't know how you interpret this, but I would say using sort of digital platforms and I, I don't know, how would you Yeah, um, what are my thoughts? Well, I can see there's some fantastic um, businesses like Arbon, for example, are built on network marketing um, and it seems to, um, if you do it right, it, it, it works um, for certain sort of people. Um, what I'd like to talk about is network and in startup, uh, one of the sayings is your your network is your net worth. And certainly if you're considering a career um, in yeah. innovation or entrepreneurship or startup, then you really need to cultivate a rich 
network of mentors, uh, of industry leaders and people who can really help guide and shape your thinking as you test ideas and, and, uh, and move, move your business forward. So um, you need to cultivate that and you need to really seek out those people who, uh, who, who do have great ideas and can challenge your own thinking. Yeah. Okay, so we've got quite a few questions, not very much time. So we're going to have a look at, um, I'm going to pick a couple of these. So um, first one, understand that failure is an ingredient for success. How do you keep back up from constant failure and maintain the spirit to keep trying? You cry a lot. Um, no, you don't. You. So, so what's the saying? Fail fast? Um, yeah, because then it hurts less. Yeah, <laughs> you know, something like that. Um, I think failure is just part of it. I mean, look at some of the biggest startups in the world and they, they started doing something else and failed and then iterated and pivoted. And I think failure is a dirty word and you need to get comfortable with it and understand this is just part of the process of testing, putting to bed things that aren't working and then moving on to that to that next thing. So, um, And we're also I'm creating a range of uh, startup body armour for you know all the knocks that you're going to yeah, get. Yeah, exactly. But you, that's part of that when we talked earlier about the traits for an entrepreneur, it's a part of that resilience and it's part of that, you know, comfortability with, with knowing that you don't have all the answers but you are going to keep, keep trying. Yep. Um, another quick one. Do you have any tips for getting into entrepreneurship whilst working full time? And kind of and you know, similar to that, how do you start your startups or what do you yeah, do so to get going? I, I think I think keep working in your day job, but but start at night or before work. Just start researching and really trying to understand more about either the idea if you've got one or the industry you're looking uh, to move yourself into, and just start trying to do a lot of R and D. Talk to people. If you try, you know, go and visit the Wade Institute or talk to people like Laura or myself. We're going to give you our social tags in a minute so you can get in touch. Just start doing research as you would with any any project to really um, get a good handle on on uh, on the whole startup scape, if you like. The other thing you can do is there's so many meetups across town and there's um, so many rich resources on the on the internet. And so I would encourage you to just start doing a lot of homework around yeah. understanding the space. Do, do stuff. That's yeah. the difference between having ideas and doing entrepreneurship. Just yeah. start doing stuff. And I think this goes to any tips for networking. People are really interested if you've, you've got a story to tell. So actually go and do stuff and have a thought or have an idea or just be curious. And then you can start asking people for like, oh, can I go for coffee? Or um, yeah, I'm really interested in this. I want to learn more because no one really ever turns down people that are interested and want help. Yeah, that's right. And I think there's a great, uh, even if you're an introvert and you find it quite hard um, networking and it's, you know, it's not always comfortable being yeah. in a space with a lot of people. There's a great question I always use. Um, I think it's a great question, but it's a good icebreaker. And really, if when I meet new people uh, and I might be intimidated by them or not quite know how to get into the conversation, I often will say, tell me about the interesting thing you're working on at the moment or what interesting thing yeah. are you doing or something like that and get them to talk about themselves. And that way you play a role just dropping in a question here and there. But it's a really great way to engage someone. And people love talking about themselves. Yeah, just to get to hear all the stories. Yeah. Okay, I think we've got time for one more. So I'm just going to answer the one about um, how do you decide between being a reseller, so buying the product and repackaging it and selling it versus producing the product yourself? So this is kind of a supply chain. Yeah, really asking, getting into the business model there. Yeah, I suppose it's a, look, it's a really great question um, and I suppose Amazon effectively do that. I mean, they provide the means for, you know, reselling a whole bunch of products. The problem with reselling is the barrier to entry is very low. So if somebody else then took that product and could resell it cheaper or get it to the customer faster or in a way that is better than you, well, then you're very quickly out of market. So your sort of unique selling proposition, it's another term in startup, your USP, um, is not really there. So I think if you're going to go into a reselling business, make sure that you've got some good advice around whether you've got sovereignty or, to, or autonomy within the market um, that you're going to operate in. So you've got a single license, for example, for distribution for that product. Um, otherwise, those barriers to entry can be a bit low for you to be sustainable over the long term. Fantastic. So uh, we're going to answer the rest of the questions by text. But any final thoughts for our... Budding entrepreneurs, final thoughts are just start and try it and embrace innovation because disruption is here and it's not scary. And thanks for being with us tonight. It's been a delight to chat to you. And thank you to Melbourne University and the alumni community for having us as guests. 
Um, and please do visit the Wade Institute. Uh, yeah, come and say hi on. to some real live entrepreneurs. Um, I've got um, here a couple of social handles and if you did want to get in touch, um, then please do. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Girl World and at Doremi Creative and you can also connect with the Wade Institute there below at that website and also via the hashtag and, uh, and that handle. Um, so additionally, there are a number of resources and websites at the University of Melbourne itself um, if you're more local to here and you want to dive in, the Carlton Connect initiative is fantastic. The Melbourne Accelerator Program, which is Melbourne Uni University's uh, local accelerator. It's a University of Melbourne Young Entrepreneurs Collective, um, actually really active across the university and they um, have a website and you can jump on there. And there's also a uh, upcoming event, which is the Graduate Study Expo, uh, and that's coming up in October. So we are going to wind up now and uh, hand you back to Natasha. Um, so thank you again for having us tonight and, uh, and we look forward to chatting to you afterwards via text. All right, thank you so much, Madeline and Laura. You were a delight to listen to your really excellent communicators. Now, a little tip for the listeners back at home. Madeline shared this with me before, but she did tell me that uh, key to being an entrepreneur is to have intense curiosity. And now that has really stuck with me. And I hope that um, our audiences at home have, have gotten that as well. And I hope it has been helpful for everyone who has been listening in. We've got really good connections at, with alumni around the world like Madeline and Laura. Um, so if you would like to network and exchange ideas and just find out what's the latest happening, just jump online and our social media handles are on the presentation slides. We'll also be sending you a recording of this webinar a week from now, so you won't miss anything out. Um, so just find any, any, any information that you'd like to find out, just jump online and look for us there. Um, we also have a survey that we'd like you to fill out because we'd really like to hear what you'd like to hear next, what kind of topics you'd be interested in hearing um, from our speakers. So I think that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next time. Good night.